Hello everyone. Today I am joined by Yayan the Lion McKenzie. Yayan, how are we doing today? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Very happy to talk to you. I don't get to talk to people from Welsh too or Wales too much, but well, yeah. <laughs> Welsh fighters and everything. You know, I work for Combat Sports UK, so it's pretty cool. You know, I don't don't get to talk to people from the European side as much. So I'm very interested in being able to talk to you today, seriously. Sweet. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too, mate. So you fight on Cage Warriors, April 6th against Solomon Simon. So I talked to a couple people that know Cage Warriors very well, and they told me that this was like a can't-miss fight. Two really high-level prospects, two, like, two, two of the better guys coming up. So I just wanted to ask, what do you think about this fight, and just how much are you looking forward to it? I mean, yeah, it's super exciting, obviously. When we were looking at this, uh, looking at fights originally, there was a couple offered to us. I think the, the Solomon fight really kind of piqued our interest. Obviously, we're looking, as I go through the pro ranks, to to take those tougher fights, mm -hmm. to take the fights that will build my profile. And, you know, it's it's a big risk for for both of us, you know, 3-0 and versus 3-0. and mm -hmm. We both got something to lose, especially so early on. You'll see a lot of guys who are, like, padding their records. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you've got two undefeated prospects going at it. You know, all, all, both, all three of our wins are finishes. Super exciting, so... There's a lot on the line, but I think that makes it a little bit better. Yeah, no, I think it makes it a lot more interesting, at least from, you know, a fan's perspective and everything, seeing two young, undefeated guys going at it and just, you know, who can who can come out on top. And I'm really, I'm looking forward to it now, too, and after what my friends described it to me as, because it really seems like it's going to be an awesome fight. So, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, you guys both have a very extensive amateur career. I think he had 18 fights, you had, like, 14, I want to say. So yeah, I just wa I just wanted to ask, like, do you think this is going to look a lot more of like a higher level fight than it will be like a three and O versus three and O kind of fight? Because you guys have like those big amateur careers behind you. hundred mm -hmm. percent. I mean, you've got a lot of these people who, you know, they might have four amateur fights and they're going into the pro and they're, and they're building themselves and building their skill set at pro. Whereas, you know, me and Scott Solomon, with all the experience we had, we built our careers and our, our skill sets at amateur so that yeah. transition to pro for both of us clearly we both had free fights last year it's super easy we're used to the fight camps we're used to all the training um and i think our skill levels are a lot higher than a lot of guys you'll see who are like i said only having three or four amateur fights so i think it's going to be a very high level fight so yeah so this will be obviously your first fight with cage warriors one i wanted to ask you know how how does it feel to be fighting in such a big promotion in at just 23 years old and also how do you um how do you see like your future going with them do you see yourself fighting with them for like a couple of years yeah i mean i was I'm, I'm very grateful i've got a very good team around me not just in the gym coaches and training partners but also i've got a great management team um my manager remy has sorted me a lot of opportunities i mean the fact that i fought in america after just being one and oh um, is an unbelievable experience the whole fight week and everything uh and now the fact that i'm fighting on cage warriors you know it's U U europe's biggest promotion it, it yeah it, it feels it feels deserved i put a lot of hard work in for amateur and through pro so it's um it, it definitely you know it's not a surprise to me um but you know as far as the future goes i'm i'm completely open i'll, I'll go with what's right at the time obviously i know cage warriors have that uh prize fighter coming up yeah you know if i can get in something like that where there's money like that on the line you know it'd be great to get in early on as well so yeah i'm uh, open to opportunities okay yeah sure. maybe collect a bounty or two in the process you know why not seriously exactly, yeah. <laughs> so uh okay yeah that makes a lot of sense i feel like uh I feel like it's pretty interesting, you know, being so young and being in such a big promotion. I was looking through the card and I was going to say, like, how is it going to feel to be like going from a main event slot to a spot that's potentially lower on the card? But you guys seem like you may be on the main card. I mean, seriously, like <laughs> like I was I was looking through the card and I was like, damn, like they have one of the more intriguing matchups on that card. So do you do you know yet if you are going to be on the main card or not? I've, I've not got a clue, honestly. <laughs> um but you know when when the you know when it first got kind of sorted that was fighting a cage where his part of me was kind of like oh it'd be, be nice to be one of the first fights on and then you know go because i got a few people you know a good crew going to support me okay. i'll go to the crowd sit with them watch the rest of the fights but then obviously i was looking at the card coming together and like you said we're probably going to be quite high up on it which honestly doesn't surprise me he's a he's a hometown lad from dublin 
like two undefeated prospects it, you know compared to some of the fights on there I, I would say it's one of the bigger ones mm -hmm. so i wouldn't be surprised if we knew that you know we're, on, we're def probably going to be on the main card i don't know how high up but i'd say we're definitely main card material for sure yeah no i would 100 percent have to agree with you i mean seriously like you guys you guys seem like one of the most intriguing fights that could be on the main card so i just don't understand how they wouldn't put either of you on the main card so you've been doing b sorry you've been doing bjj for years um is that how you got started in mma i from what i could tell you've been doing it for like at least seven years now but i don't know if it's been longer just tell me your start in bjj and your path there yeah uh, i just started mma as a whole uh eight years i think it was god was it not nine years eight, i think it was eight years ago i was okay. yeah i just turned 15 so eight years ago um i just started off first ever class i did was a wrestling class okay and that's kind of like my you know, one of my biggest strengths is my wrestling. So I started off wrestling class and then I think I'd done two sessions and then I I think I was doing field hockey at the time because I'd always been in between different sports and I'd done two sessions, completely dropped that. And then I was in six days a week <laughs> and you know, the rest is history. Eight, eight, eight years on, obviously jujitsu is probably my strongest point, but that's just that I think that's just come from like the kind of gyms I've been training at really. And obviously you know, the jiu-jitsu at Craig's is, is best in South Wales, I'd say. And then I'd argue that the striking at Celtic's the best in South Wales. So I've got the best of both worlds now. Hopefully I'll be able to show that on fight night with the striking as well. Yeah, so you talked about Craig Ewers. You train at Craig Ewers Academy. And you also train over at um, Celtic. And I know Joe Ori has been someone that's been like involved in your career for most of the process. I just wanted to ask what yeah. some of those guys, like the impact they've made on your career, obviously, that you've kind of been with them from like the ground up but i just kind of wanted to ask like w just just talk about your coaches basically <laughs> yeah so um i guess i'll start with joe because it makes the most sense uh when i started eight years ago joe was my first ever coach mm -hmm. so he's seen me gone from like you know a shy 15 year old going into the gym for the first time to you know the pro pro fighter at 23 i am now now so there was a, a you know i started with joe eight years ago and then uh the gym we were training at closed down so I ended up moving to Craig's started training under Craig's and then I was also training under uh I, I don't know if you ever heard of Paul Hands of Stone Jenkins had about 100 Sounds 100 familiar. pro fights he's yeah he's a he's a UK MMA pioneer so okay. I was training with him for about um two years before I moved to Celtic but um while I was training at Craig's I hadn't seen Joe in maybe two years and then he started training at Craig's and that's how we got back together with the coaching and he started the MMA classes there. That's awesome. And then, yeah, and then how I got involved with Celtic um, was during lockdown, uh, Mason Jones was looking for training partners. Now, I already knew Mason from Craig, but he was looking for training partners. So I was lucky enough to go Celtic Pride, train with them. Uh, and that's how I met Giff, obviously Greg, who does the jiu-jitsu up there. I met met them through that and I kind of just never looked back and I'm you know obviously COVID was not a great time but in terms of my training it was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened because I don't know if I would have ever uh, stayed up Celtic but you know my obviously you know the guys I got comes corner me I've got um Joe I've got Craig I've got Giff they all play massive part in my day-to-day -day training and I'm I'm very grateful for them inside and outside yeah, so you mentioned Mason Jones a bit there. I wanted to ask, you know, I've seen you train with Mason Jones. You've trained with Brendan Lochnane. You've trained with some very, like, some of the best guys from your area, some from the UK region, everything. So I did want to ask, like, are those guys, like, inspirations to you? And were they inspirations to you, like, even before you started training with them? Yeah, I mean, I've always looked up to Mason. I think because when I started the sport, I didn't really have a background in, like, it know anything about mma <laughs> in terms of watching it and stuff so i was i think i believe i was at the show for mason's pro debut oh wow and i didn't know him i knew i knew of him then um but i wasn't like as close to him as i am now as a training partner but obviously watching him kind of build his way up the uk rankings the way that every pro fight mason had was a tougher test but it was the perfect building block to get him into you know when he you know when he got won those two world titles and got into the UFC. And then obviously you've got other Welsh guys. You've got the likes of Brett Johns, Jack Shaw, 
watching them all go on, and now Urban Elliot as well, watching yes. all them go on to be so successful and come from these little Welsh towns is uh, is quite inspiring. Yeah, for sure. As you mentioned, Jack Shore as well. Um, I saw he and Richard Shore cornered you in a boxing match years and years ago. Yeah. Has um has that relationship kept up with over the years? So yeah, so that was so my first ever gym was a uh, Tulare Combat Cardiff. It was mm-hmm. an affiliation of Tulare Combat before they become uh, Shore MMA. So uh, Shaky was one of my coaches. Well, he was my main coach, and then I was well, yeah, the head coach. And then I had Joe and another coach, Anthony Johnson, who were the the coaches at the Cardiff affiliation. So that was during the time that was just when the Cardiff gym had closed down and it was my last fight under shaky was okay. that boxing match at the Joe Kawasaki show. And, uh, now like the, obviously it's just, it's a, it's a big old sport. And then if you're not training, you can't put, uh, you're not going to be able to put the energy into each other. Obviously we're still friendly. We, we see each other all the time at shows on the regional circuit. So there's, there's no, no animosity or, or, or anything. I've got nothing respect, nothing but respect for both of them. But in terms of like a coach relationship, that isn't there anymore. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So I did want to ask, you said that you were watching MMA and that's kind of how you started getting involved with actually training and fighting in the sport. What was the, uh, what was the kind of start of your love for MMA? What, like, was it a certain event you watched? Was it like, just, what was it? I've, I've very i was a very very casual fan at the start but it was always um it was, it was, i think the first fight i ever watched um when i started training was the conor mcgregor eddie alvarez like i was you know fairly fairly fresh um and i think kind of from that moment on i was a massive mcgregor fan still am and i find it hard to root against him i think because i was <laughs> one of the big the first big fight i ever watched okay yeah no i uh I think a lot of people started to get into the sport around McGregor era, but it's kind of cool to see now, like the people that, the people that weren't training, weren't fighting, that are now fighters that got into the sport because of him, starting to make their rise and their rise into the sport. And yeah. like you said, just 23 years old now, you actually started your amateur career just at 17 years old. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. What kind of went into that thought process of? getting in the cage so young and actually going in there and getting that experience just as a 17 year old. Yeah. Like I said, when I, when I started training, I was very fresh to the idea of MMA. I had no intention of competing apart from just enjoying the training. But when you put, you know, out, you know, you put three hours a day, six days a week into training, obviously you're going to end up competing. Yeah. You start to get pretty good. I did. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. You start to get pretty good. And then people start to realize that, um, but I did, I think I had six interclubs. Mm. So I just went to other gyms, fought in like their little cage. And I won all of them by armbar. And I was just kind of like a one trick pony at the time, just jujitsu. <laughs> um, and then my coach just offered me, at the time Paul Jenkins offered me a fight on Budo, which mm. which is quite um, funny because I made my amateur debut on Budo and also my professional debut. So I oh, kind of awesome. came full circle. Yeah, it was a, you know several years later making my debut but um it just happened and then as soon as i fought that one time i was like this is what i want to do that's awesome and it's just gone gone from there yeah yeah it's awesome that you know you kind of just you join just to start training you know you just just wanted to be involved in the sport in some way and then yeah you ended up look where you are now cage warriors probably on the main card like one of the better prospects out of Wales at the moment, I'd say. So, I mean, it's just, it's just a very inspiring story to know that like within such a short amount of time, I guess you kind of not even short cause you've been training for a bit now, but just pretty short amount of time. And just at such a young age that you've been able to kind of carve out this path for yourself and kind of get into this big promotion, you know, have all these fights, make a name for yourself. Like it's really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not only the, the team I've got around me, but I've also put a lot of hard work in. It's been, you know, for the past eight years, all I've done is train. Obviously, yeah. with that little blip in lockdown, but all I've done is train, train, train. So a lot of the time where people are like, wow, you might get it quite a bit, where it's like, oh, you're so lucky to be able to fight a cage rose. It's like, it's not a matter of luck. It's a matter of literally Putting sacrificing in the effort. so much. Yeah, exactly. Put, yeah. And then, you know, with, with the team around me, it's uh, it's pretty impossible not to succeed as well. So you've spent a lot of time in Dubai training just 
going on trips there and everything one i don't yeah. know how close dubai is to wales so i'm not sure if it's that far of like a journey but i will say i just noticed that you spend a lot of time there whether it's just going there to go in the desert going there to train with brendan Lochnane, going there at team nogara like i just wanted to ask you know why are you in dubai so much and just is that your favorite place to go uh yeah so my dad moved to dubai oh, god i want to say like 11 no it's longer than that it's probably close to 15 years now okay um so I've been there a lot, a loads and loads of times over the years. Count is probably close to fifty now. How many times I've been there? But um, to answer your question, <laughs> the re yeah, the reason I'm there so long uh, all the time is because my dad lives there. Okay. So obviously I have a direct connection there. Uh, distance wise, I'd say halfway across the world, it's it's good like eight hours on the plane to Dubai because it's in the Middle East, obviously. And um, yes, it is a hundred percent my favorite place to go I, I obviously as a bonus my dad lives there yeah. so when you go there you've got someone to stay you don't have to pay for the expensive hotels but uh yeah i just love it there and is if if there was anywhere i'd live apart from the here it'd be there 100 percent. okay so how many times have you been to the u.s i know you obviously had the fight in ufl but was that the only time you've ever been to the u.s or are you a frequent visitor of the united states of america <laughs> that that is the the first ever time I've been to the US. So that was my first ever experience, which nice. was, again, like that's why I'm just so grateful to be able to do what I do and to get those opportunities to get paid to go to the US, not mm -hmm. even pay for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I guess, you know, US might not be the best country in the world because Yayan likes Dubai better. So I, I'll take, <laughs> I'm going to take his word for it because I've never been to Dubai. So <laughs> I highly recommend, mate, if you get the chance. I, I Hey. I definitely won't turn it down if I get the opportunity. So you've kind of been cycling between 135 pounds and 145 pounds throughout most of your uh, pro career at this point. I wanted to ask, yeah. what weight do you think you're going to end up settling down at? And what would be the reason for choosing that weight instead of the other weight? So I have uh, been my nutritionist since my pro debut. Uh, Sean Aspinall, actually the cousin of heavyweight champ uh tom aspinall that's awesome so he, he's a br brilliant nutritionist yeah so i worked with him since my um uh professional debut where we, we wanted to go in at featherweight just because i'd never done a big cut before so we wanted to ease in uh, so we've done the featherweight and then se seven weeks later we made the drop to bantamweight and then obviously after the ufl we stayed at bantamweight again for the adrenaline fight and we've gone back up to featherweight. We just basically want to put proper building blocks in place. Uh, obviously, you know, it's part of the sport, cutting the weight. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a very nice size bantamweight. I, I'm a good size featherweight, but it's very easy for me to make the weight. Okay. Like, it's not a challenge whatsoever for me to make featherweight. So we just want to put um, the blocks in place so that when, uh, after this fight, it comes to a point where, like, we could be at a point where bantamweight's easy every time. And obviously, you know, as fighters get older, they will have to move up weights. The, you know, uh, probably a, f a move to featherweight is inevitable, but I know I definitely have a good run, you know, a good four or five years at bantamweight where I can make a really good run for it. Okay. And the Solomon Simon fight is at 145, right? It's at featherweight? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So yeah. um, is that kind of just because you had the opportunity to go to Cage Warriors and take such a big fight? You weren't obviously you weren't going to say no. And that's why you're at 145 pounds right now. Yeah, that, and I think I can be competitive at both weights. I don't think size is an issue at featherweight, okay. uh, and I don't think speed's an issue at bantamweight. I think I can comfortably uh, sift between both, but obviously, it makes sense to sell in a division and work your way up in that division. So, and of course, it's such a big opportunity fighting on cage warriors, right? So, of course, yeah, we'll, we'll get this done. Well, you know, you never know, right? If I if I go in there on the, you know two weeks Saturday and I feel absolutely amazing at featherweight and it's it's just like I said it's a super easy weight for me to make it's not a struggle at all maybe I'll stay there for a bit or, or maybe I'll just stay there end of but you know in, in our heads we, we know I can make bantamweight we know how strong how big I'd be at bantamweight so 
I think we'll, we'll see how it goes after this fight. But okay. no, I'd definitely be looking at a ban and weight move All on right. the cards, yeah. Kind of, kind of just anything. playing it as it goes, you know, seeing how you feel in there yeah. against, like, you know, another undefeated prospect at 145 pounds, yeah. seeing, you know, how the fight goes and then deciding from there. That makes a lot of sense to me. You know, you're still young. You still can, you know, make a lot of decisions within your future. I'm so, like, I'm st- and I'm still growing as well. That's the important bit, actually? right? I'm still young. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a big, big strong boy, isn't it? So <laughs> it's still developing, still putting on muscle. So, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll just take it fight by fight. But I, w- I would like to settle at band and weight, make a good run there. Okay. So you're, I think it was either your second or third amateur fight. You fought in IMMAF, which is a yes. massive amateur you know federation and just a lot going on there and you actually out wrestled a russian i'd love to ask you about that and just you know how did, how, what, did that kind of like boost your confidence a bit knowing that you could like go out there and out wrestle a russian <laughs> yeah i mean I'll, I'll be honest with you i remember you know young little kids mm-hmm. i think i was one and one in my amateur career and then i got drawn against the top c to win the division um uh, against the russian uh, I was absolutely shit myself. <laughs> but I'm not even not even lie. I was I was terrified. But when I started fighting him, the first one was really tough. He took me down a few times, maybe like two or three times. Okay. Um, but he couldn't get me out of there. And then come out, and my coach was like, "Look, stop popping the right hand." Came out every time I hit him with the right hand, he backed up. And then I was able to get him up the cage and just work him clinch work. And I felt actually, I'm stronger than this guy. And then, you know, the, the round two and three really dominant. Uh, and it, it was given to me in the end. And that was just, you know, such a huge moment. It was, you know, even though I, I lost my next fight at the IMAFs, I think that was one of the standout moments of the the, the entire weekend or the, the entire week of events was the fact that some little kid from <laughs> Wales went and out wrestled, wrestled a Russian. Like, it doesn't happen. And then ever since then, I've been known as, like, the Russian Slayer as okay. well. Have you fought any Russians since then? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure for my third amateur title, uh, September 2022, mm-hmm. I fought a guy called uh, Ruslan Frabje. I, I, he's he's definitely definitely Eastern European. Yeah, I was about to say it sounds I'm Russian to me, pre- but I'm pretty sure on his topology though he's Russian. Okay. Um, I choked him out in the first round, so. Yeah, so I'm making a bit of a habit of it, I guess. Yeah, no, the Russian killer. I love it, man. I love it. Exactly, yeah. Maybe change it from the lion soon. You never know. <laughs> oh, God. oh, I don't know if I could do that, man. Yeah. I could have it as like a side nickname, but okay. I couldn't I couldn't get rid of the lion. So uh, let me ask about that. Like, how did that lion nickname come together? Yeah, it's funny. I was actually um, talking about this with my... I was in for a massage earlier. I was talking to my uh, massage therapist about it, but... Joe, my first coach, mm-hmm. uh, when I started there, I think him and the lads kind of started calling me Yai and the Lion. I think there was a couple. There was um, Joe still calls me it now. It's a Scrap Iron Yian, and <laughs> now it's Scrap Iron Lion as well. So, yeah, Yai and the Lion started, and it just it just stuck like that. That's usually how it happens, though. I mean, one, yeah, just one, either it, your coach or one of the training wasn't, partners. Exactly, it wasn't yeah. forced. It just kind of happened, yeah. and now that's it. It's yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes makes good sense. I mean, I like the nickname. It kind of it fits it fits your name very well. So I, I, if, if if my name's pronounced correctly, it works. When yes. people start going, oh, is it Lou and the Lion? Like, no, no, no. It's Yai and the Lion, like it. Lewan, Luan, Le, Luan the Lion. Yeah, it just doesn't work. No, no, it does not. Okay. So you've been you've been in the corner a couple of times as of late i wanted to ask how has it been like you know being on the other side of the cage and being able to like help your teammates while they're in the middle of their fights uh i love it and i hate it <laughs> i love being able to help my teammates you know they they've obviously put loads of time into me in training and i've put loads of time to them training so to actually be there and to watch them get that win it, it's amazing but on the other on the other side of it, it's when you're in the cage fighting, you're in complete control of what's going on in there, right? You, your coaches can be there, they can say stuff to you, but ultimately, it's up to you. It's the fighter yeah. who makes the decisions and who does the actions, right? So when you're cornering, it's it's the opposite. You don't have any control. You can say what you need to say, and you can give them all the pep talk in the world, but ultimately, it's under their control. And it's horribly, it's nasty. It's nerve wracking when your teammates are fighting, but 
that feeling of watching them win is almost as good as winning yourself. And I think you'll find a lot of coaches who don't fight anymore. Yeah. Their, their way of getting that high is fighting you know, through having their, their fighters. Win fights. Yeah. Fighting through their fighters. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I saw years and years ago, you went to an Iron Maiden concert. I wanted to ask what's kind of, what kind of music <laughs> interests you have now and just, you know, how, wh- what music do you listen to basically? Uh, gonna, uh, mate, I'll get roasted for this. I, I really am not an avid uh, listener of music okay. at all. The Iron Maiden thing was a mate had a spare ticket and oh. invited me along. I had a great time and I've actually got the the uh, little guitar pick up in my room, <laughs> just still by my desk from all those years ago. But um, when people ask me, like, what kind of music do you listen to? And my answer is always the same. It's whatever comes on on the radio. Like, I'm not, you know, when I'm lifting weights, I don't have headphones on. I just lift weights. Okay. I don't need the music. When I train, whatever music the DJ puts on, you know, whoever's in charge of the speaker in the gym, I listen to that. Okay. If I'm taking the class, there's no music on because I don't <laughs> have any on my phone. So... I, I don't I don't really like listen to music I I, I will li- but when it comes to like what I enjoy I'll listen to anything except for like um screamo kind of like death metal stuff okay apart from that I I enjoy all types of music but I couldn't like tell you oh I, I always listen to this genre like I don't have a Spotify playlist or anything like that and I you know, I get roasted for it all the time. People are like, oh, he hates music or he doesn't listen to music. And I was like, yeah, it's just, it's just never been my thing, really. Yeah, who cares, though? I mean, if that's not your thing, that's not your thing. I mean, everyone everyone has their likes and dislikes. And if you're, if you're not a fan of music, I mean, you're not a fan of music. Simple as that. You don't yeah. need to be. You're a fighter, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I like, you know, I do, I do like my walkout song, though. That's, that's, the, that's my, probably my favorite song. Okay. <laughs> it's my walkout song. So I say this in the nicest, nicest way possible. Um, is the food in Wales as shitty as it is in the UK? <laughs> oh, come on, mate. You haven't tried some Brit- proper British cu- cuisine. What, do you, what, uh, what kind of food you guys got over there? You know, like fish and chips. Okay. Uh, that's elite, mate. Yeah, um, it is, for sure. The, the, the thing is with British food, like full English. You ever seen a full English breakfast? Uh... Maybe I'm bacon, sure. egg, hash browns, sausages. Sounds good to me. Black pudding. <laughs> yeah. See the what, black pudding. What, what is black pudding? Uh, I don't actually know. <laughs> I feel like it's it's some kind of pig meat. I don't I like. I don't know if it's like innards or something. I don't know, but it tastes delicious. I okay. love black pudding. Um, but yeah, you, got, you know, like oh, uh, bangers of mash, okay. sausage. Mashed potatoes, gravy, roast dinner. You know, it's 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 pretty basic. I think for a lot of people outside, British food could look very bland, but it's the taste. It's where it's at. It's all okay. it's all like home comfort food. It makes you feel really warm. Obviously, I know, you know, in the in the US, in Canada, it's all bright. And when I went to America, the food was amazing, but there's nothing like home. So. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I guess. You, gotta, you just got to try it, mate. You got to try it. Okay. Okay. I, uh, maybe I'll take a trip out there and try it because, I yeah. mean, I don't know. Have you ever seen the videos that the guy makes? What is it? The Chinese food? The I think he's from the UK, I want to say. I think his name's like Nasty. Oh, like the, like the, like the munch boxes and yeah, stuff. Yeah, his name's Nasty on Instagram, I think. He makes like, he right. like, it's like the chips with the, like, I don't know. It's just, it's weird to explain, but I don't know if you've ever seen him or not. I mean... I understand how a Chinese can look. A British Chinese is yeah. not a regular Chinese, right? Because obviously you've got the chips on there, mm-hmm. and then you've got chicken balls, and you've got curry sauce, and it doesn't make sense, but it it does make sense if you eat it. Oh, here I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show him real quick. It's this guy. Oh yes, yeah, so, yeah. There's quite a few of them. Yeah, yeah there's that, that's fish and chips. That is, mate. That's. That's see, next level, that is. See, that's that's just <laughs> chips, though. I think that's what is. I don't think it, it's chicken and chips. I think, or is it? I don't uh, even know. I'm, maybe I'm not from even, a kebab shop, maybe, then. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe. I'm not. I'm not yeah. sure. But I was just wondering if you had seen him because that's like, that's like kind of. That that looks like decent food. Is that, I know it's is weird, that what you base decent. your your judgment of British food is no, off those videos? No, I uh, I <laughs> I saw other videos of like other british okay. people his aren't bad his his i could get down with some of those some of those oh, like, okay. chips yeah, yeah, yeah. meals and stuff like that but there there were some i saw that like 
I looked at it and I was just like, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you, you, don't, you, don't, you can't question why. You just need to try you yourself. Need to try. Because okay. it doesn't look like it makes sense, but it just makes sense. Okay. Okay. So last question for me. I just wanted to ask, where do you see yourself in five years? Let's say. Five years. So I'll be 28. I'll, you know, my, my dream ever since I started fighting was always UFC. I'd like to think I'd be, you know, in five years time, I, I want to be in the UFC. I'm not, I want to be, you know, near that title at 28 years old, really. Okay. That's my featherweight. I just, I want to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to be one of the best fighters in the world in five years, 100%. Okay. And I actually lied. I have one more question. I, I started asking people this recently because I feel like everyone has like a different reason. So I wanted to ask, just answer however you'd like. Why do you fight? Because it's gotten to a point where it's all I know and it's all I want to do. It's the only thing that I'm passionate about. I'd say I think I struggled a long time when I was younger to find kind of like my, my purpose. I guess you will. I, I, was, I went through so many different sports um, so young before I found MMA. And my dad always said that the reason I got into MMA was because there's this is the closest you can get to having no rules. And I think the reason I struggled in sports when I was younger was because there's so many rules holding you back. And, you know, like I said, when I started training, I was addicted straight away. And it's it's all I want to do. It's pretty much the only thing I'm really good at as well. Um, but, yeah, it's, it, you know, it, at the moment, it's certainly not about the money. It's about just the enjoyment for the process of the sport and the actual competition and, I think when you get the high for winning a fight, you, that you realize there is nothing like it. And the only way to keep getting that high is to keep fighting and to keep winning because nothing matches it. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes sense to me. I mean, I, after trying so many athletics as a kid and everything, like, you know, it, it must be tough to like, you know, finally find your niche in terms of that. It seems like, yeah. it seems like you were always a sports kind of kid, you know, playing field hockey and stuff growing up. And it, it's just nice to see that like, you did find your niche and you found it pretty early on too. It didn't take like years and years and years. You you were 17 years old when you had your first amateur fight. So you kind of had, yeah. you kind of had it figured out before most people ever do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, kids are starting younger and younger. Like yeah. I could train with some absolute beasts of kids <laughs> that are like 14 years yeah. old and I hadn't even stepped in foot of a gym, but <laughs> you know, all, although maybe I started later than, some kids i the way i've progressed and how much i've achieved in such little time of training like when i tell people i've been training eight years and i've had 14 amateur fights won three titles represented my country four times at the imaf and and i'm free and as the pro science cage warriors they can't believe I've, it's only been eight years in the sport yeah so i think i've definitely made up for a lot of uh lost time there oh yeah for sure 100 percent. all right Ev everyone tune into this interview because this is a fun one with yayan mckenzie Yayan the Lion McKenzie takes on Solomon Simon on Cage Warriors April 6th. Yayan, thank you for talking with me. Yeah, thank you for having me, mate. Of really course. appreciate it.